everyone, and welcome to CTL's Education Professional Development Series. My name is Amy Alcalisi, EdTech Project Manager here at CTO, and I'm joined by Stephanie Shea, Marketing Manager. If you are not familiar with CTO, we've been headquartered in Portland, Oregon, providing innovative IT solutions to education and government customers for over 26 years. We're a Google for Education partner, specializing in rugged CTL Chromebooks, laptops, convertibles, two-in-ones, and tablets designed specifically for K-12 education. Over the last two and a half years, we've worked with Google to introduce a line of CTL Chromebooks that have been recommended by PC Magazine as the best choice for Chromebooks in education. Woohoo! As part of our commitment to education, CTL offers free professional development webinars on a variety of topics relevant to K-12 EdTech. Today's webinar is Pocket Lab, A Closer Look, Part 2, presented by Robbie D Douthit, I believe that's how you pronounce it, sorry Robbie, <laughs> Director of Curriculum and Community Engagement at Pocket Lab. This webinar is Part 2 in a series. If you missed Part 1, you can review the recording on our NR21 website. We'll show you a link at the end of this presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to review the attendee interface so you know how to participate in today's event. You should see something that looks like this that's on your computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening and using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone and the audio pane and the dial information will be displayed. You may type any questions into the question pane of the control panel during the presentation and they will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. But before we begin, I'd like to take a poll to learn more about our attendees today. So please indicate if you've ever used Pocket Lab. Uh, let me launch that poll. All right, I'll give you guys a couple seconds here. It shows, I don't know if you can see this, 75% no experience, 25% some experience, zero and zero. Did you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, thanks for uh, giving us your guys' input. And to let you know that Ro Robbie will um, review a little bit from part one as well just to give you guys heads up on that. So before I turn it over to Robbie for our presentation, I'd like to remind everyone about some of our Nevada 21 educators. When you visit the nr21.ctl.net website, you can learn about upcoming professional learning opportunities, sign up for updates on any upcoming events, information. You can join our Google Plus private community. That's specifically just for Nevada 21 educators. So at this time, I'll introduce Robbie, the Director of Curriculum and Community Engagement at Pocket Lab. Before joining Pocket Lab, he was a teacher in Chicago and Milwaukee for six years before he taught both middle school math and high school physics. Robbie will now take us through the functions and features of Pocket Lab. So let me transfer my screen over to his screen and have him show us how it's done. All right. Okay, so um, thanks for the introduction. Um, and again, my name is uh, Robbie Douthit, and um, so this is part two. Um, and uh, like Amy mentioned, um, if you haven't um, seen part one, um, I would recommend going back and and looking at part one. Um, but uh, if if not, that's also okay because we're going to review a couple things from part one and give a quick sort of overview of Pocket Lab before we dive into some of the um, some of the uh, the new feature or the other features that we want to talk about. So our presentation outline here, um, we're going to start with just a, a quick overview of what is Pocket Lab and how Pocket Lab can change what you're doing in your science classroom. 
again, we go over that a little bit in more detail, um, but we'll still talk about that in part uh, part two today. Um, then we're gonna we're gonna watch a few different videos today, um, and I'll kind of walk through the videos and talk you through them. Um, the first is how to connect the Pocket Lab to the Chromebook, and and then use the accelerometer, which is a very common uh, uh, sensor that's used in Pocket Lab. Um, and so I'll walk you through how to use that um, effectively. Um, and then uh, I'll show you some examples of activities um, and curriculum that we have that use the Pocket Labs accelerometer. Then we're going to go through um, some advanced features of the Pocket Lab app and how to integrate uh, Pocket Lab with Google Drive. Um, and, and then we're going to finally at the end, we're going to watch a video um, of an entire Pocket Lab investigation where you look at how air pressure and volume are related, um, which is uh, one of the NGSS uh, middle school physical science standards. Um, and so I'll show you how to set that up, um, and then uh, you'll be able to find that curriculum on our website uh, for free and download it. Um, and then at the end, uh, we'll do some, some Q&A. OK. So first, um, you know, what is Pocket Lab? So uh, Pocket Lab is a wireless sensor. Um, that's used uh, for gathering data in the world around you. So you just connect it with one button, and then you can measure things like acceleration, air pressure, altitude, temperature, magnetic fields. Um, the idea is that it's really simple to use and that it's wireless so that um, students can do all kinds of interesting um, activities that maybe they haven't been able to try before. Um, and so. Uh, uh, the Pocket Lab also then integrates with things like Google Drive so that students can uh, collaborate and share their data with each other um, and work on experiments uh, together. Um, so the, uh, our, our mission at Pocket Lab is that we believe anyone can be a scientist. Um, and, and Pocket Lab enables students and educators to explore the world around them like never before possible. So everything that we do at Pocket Lab, um, we want to enable you as the teacher and the student um, to, to get students to really explore the world and really believe in themselves as a scientist. So how, um, how is this possible and, and how is Pocket Lab used in the classroom? So imagine you're, you're a student and you're in uh, maybe a high school physics classroom. And I'm the teacher and uh, today I'm going to teach you about the angular velocity of rigid bodies. And although I can't see your hands, if I said raise your hand if you think this sounds exciting, I'm sure none of you would have put your hand up because it looks boring and it sounds boring. And this is traditionally how a lot of uh, physics is taught um, and, and a lot of science is taught. It's here's a bunch of diagrams that look really complex. Um, put them on a board or look at them in a textbook and try to figure out how to do that. And, and we all know that that's not uh, that, that is one way students can learn, but it's not. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that students learn, and, and that's not a very hands-on way. Um, but if I were to say that angular velocity of rigid bodies is really just a fancy way of saying spinning, um, and we talked about gymnastics and how um, you know gymnasts flip and tumble, um, and how that's related to angular velocity, that may be um, a more interesting way to approach it. And if we have Pocket Lab, in just about one minute, we can do something like um, like we did here with our friend Cindy, who's a gymnast, and um, she just uh, attached the taped the Pocket Lab to her waist, um, and then in about just one minute, we set up an experiment where she's doing flips and tumbles, and we're measuring her her rate of rotation and doing experiments with that. Um, and so this is actually me in the in a classroom um, where I'm having students make hypotheses about how they spin in different directions and then their students are working together uh, to test those hypotheses with data. You can do experiments on magnetic fields, you can put Pocket Lab inside a soccer ball, um, kick it around the soccer field and do experiments with that, um, experiments on force, um, projectile motion where you're launched in the air and do different experiments with that. So. The idea is that Pocket Lab is easy to use and it's wireless so that you can do all kinds of um, unique uh, and interesting experiments um, and explorations with students. So um, how exactly does Pocket Lab work? 
and what's the setup. Um, the Pocket Lab sensor itself uh, has actually five sensors, and those measure all um, all the different uh, measurements that you have in the Pocket Lab app come from those sensors. Um, and then you can connect Pocket Lab to your Chromebook. Um, you can also connect it to uh, if you have an iPhone or iPad at home, if you want to take the Pocket Lab home and connect there, uh, it connects to Android, uh, Mac, and Windows 10. So if you want to take your Pocket Lab outside of the classroom and do experiments, um, you can as well. So those, all of the apps, Pocket Lab apps, are free to download. Um, you just search for them in the App Store for your device. Um, and then uh, the data can integrate with things like Google Drive, um, Scratch, just some different software that you can then use uh, to do more in-depth analysis of the data that you collect. Um, so at Pocket Lab, we have over 6,000 Pocket Labs are out there. Um, we have users from all over the world, 43 different countries, schools all over the country, and they're constantly coming up with new ideas and new ways to explore with Pocket Lab. They're sending us uh, their ideas, their experiments, and so we're posting them on social media, but also on our website and you can find a lot of ideas that come from teachers like yourselves. They, they post their lesson plans online. Um, we have curriculum that you can download. So you can find all that um, on our website, which we'll go over uh, at the end. And so um, just some examples of some hands-on activities that you can do with Pocket Lab. Um, here I'm launching a rocket in the upper right corner and getting uh, launch acceleration and um, uh, in the bottom we're doing some cool experiments with rotation and friction. In the middle there, there's some kids that are doing some sports science um, with Pocket Lab. Um, I've attached Pocket Lab to a pendulum there. And then the bottom one um, with the ceiling fan, and that's one where um, a user was just curious about what it would look like to attach Pocket Lab. And so they just um, attached Pocket Lab to the fan and collected a lot of data. Um, just because it was something simple that they wanted to explore. Um, so that's kind of just a, a brief overview of what Pocket Lab is and um, what are the different things that you can do with it in your science classroom. Um, and now I'm going to show you uh, just how to connect with Pocket Lab and use the accelerometer, so one of the basic sensors. Um, a couple important things to note here is that the uh, white side of the Pocket Lab is actually the front of the Pocket Lab, and that uh, this uh, in the middle is a, our Pocket Lab logo, which is also shows um, how to orient the sensors in the Pocket Lab. So we have an x-axis that goes uh, along the Pocket Lab, a y-axis that goes up and down, and then the z-axis goes through the Pocket Lab like that. Um, and then the orange side of the Pocket Lab is actually the back, um, and that's where you, if you want to remove the back plate and replace the battery, you can do that there. Okay, so um, I, I went over this in more detail in part one, um, but I'll just briefly talk about it. So um, uh, to get started with Pocket Lab, you'll need to download the app if it's not already on your Chromebook. You do that by just simply searching for the Pocket Lab in the Chrome Store. Um, and then you want to make sure that your Bluetooth is on um, and, and that's enabled. So you can do that in the lower right hand corner of, of the Chromebook. Um, and then finally you just open the Pocket Lab app and then you'll press the button on the top of the Pocket Lab, uh, bring it close and it will, and it will connect. So I'll show, I'll show that in the video. So how to connect Pocket Lab and use Pocket Lab's acceleration graph. So here's the video. Okay, so first, you want to open the Pocket Lab app, and next, hit the on-off button on the top of the Pocket Lab. Bring the Pocket Lab close to the Chromebook, and you may get a message that identifies the closest Pocket Lab by its serial number, and asks if you want to connect to it. If you do get that message, click the message to connect. The Pocket Lab will immediately begin streaming acceleration data once it's connected. And this acceleration graph can be a little tricky, so I'm going to walk you through it. As you can see, three lines are being displayed, one for each axis of the Pocket Lab, X, Y, and Z. And these lines correspond to the axis logo on the front of the Pocket Lab. So when I shake the Pocket Lab along the X axis, which is left to right, you see the red X graph move accordingly. 
when I shake the pocket lab along the y-axis up and down, the blue y-graph moves accordingly. And when I shake the uh, pocket lab along the z-axis of the logo in and out, the green z-graph moves accordingly. Next, we will look at how the acceleration graph shows you the orientation of the pocket lab. And a confusing part of this graph is why um, when the pocket lab is not moving, there is still at least one axis, uh, one graph showing one g of acceleration. And so why is this? This is because of gravity. We can't ever get rid of gravity. So gravity will always be pulling down on the accelerometer with an acceleration of 1g or 9.8 meters per second squared. So right now the y-axis is up and down. So gravity is affecting the accelerometer along the y-axis. And I'm just going to pause it for a second. So sorry, I'm just going to go back one second to show you again. So the y-axis is up and down, and that's why we have a positive 1g of acceleration along the y-axis. And that's the blue graph there. When I change the orientation of the pocket lab so that the x-axis is up and down, gravity is affecting the accelerometer now along the x-axis. And so now the x-axis, which is red, reads positive 1g. Now watch what happens when I flip the pocket lab over. So the x-axis is still up and down, but it is now upside down with the x-axis on the logo facing down. There's still one g of acceleration from gravity, but this time it's reading negative one g because the x-axis is pointing down. So again, when I orient the pocket lab, so the y-axis on the same vector as gravity up and down, the y graph shows 1g of acceleration. When I flip it over, the y-axis on the logo is facing down, so we see negative 1g of acceleration. So what about z? z goes through the pocket lab, and so when I flip the pocket lab so it's lying flat, um, the z-axis is up and down, so I get 1g along the z-axis, which is green. If I flip the pocket lab over so that the orange side is now facing up and the pocket lab is sort of upside down, um, then we get negative 1g of acceleration um, along the z-axis. So, you know, if, if you need to go back and watch this video a couple times that you sort of understand how the accelerometer works, um, that can be helpful. The main thing that you want to do is make sure that you're always sort of looking, uh, when you're getting used to how the accelerometer look, uh, works, that you're looking at the logo on the white side of the pocket lab, and that will show you um, which uh, the axes of the accelerometer. So I recommend doing this with your students, having the students look at the logo, shake the pocket lab in different directions to see how that relates. Um, to the graphs that they're seeing, and then have them change the orientation of the pocket lab like I did so that they can see how that also affects the graph. And this can also be something cool to show them that this is actually, um, there's an accelerometer in your cell phones, and that's exactly how your cell phone can figure out, um, like how your cell phone flips the screen depending on how you're holding it. That's exactly um, what, the, um, what I showed in the pocket lab is how your cell phone figures that out. So that can be sort of a way to relate that. Um, oops, sorry. Okay. So an activity that you can do with the accelerometer can be found on our website, um, which I'll show you here. So if you go to the Pocket Lab website and you click on Community, um, you will then go to our community page where you can find a lot of different resources, including all of our curriculum. If you click on the Educators tab, um, you will then get an overview of our curriculum and then um, an alignment guide to uh, where our curriculum aligns with the different NGSS standards. And then you can scroll through and click on any of our different lessons that we have. We have over um, 30 different lessons that we've created. Um, so here, 
is a really great activity to do with your students um, that uses the accelerometer. So if you click on that, um, then you can kind of get a brief overview of the lesson. Um, and then here are some different uh, the files that you can download for free uh, that will help you uh, with your lesson in, your, in the classroom. So um, here is uh, the lesson that we're on. Um, and it's uh, building a crash cart cushion um, to investigate um, uh, Newton's third law. Um, and so this is just kind of what our curriculum looks like. Um, we have a, uh, some diagrams here that show students how to set everything up. Um, but basically, you're attaching the pocket lab to a cart, crashing it into a wall. And then students are designing their own um, crash cushion, um, which will uh, try and uh, reduce the force um, of the crash. And this can be related to highway safety and things that students, um, uh, things that engineers would actually design uh, for highway safety. So they learn about things like uh, Newton's laws and momentum. Um, and then they set up their experiment here. Uh, it shows a diagram. Um, and then they design their own cushion with, with materials, uh, that, like just office supplies, um, construction paper, things like that. Um, and then the idea is that they go back and they redesign their cushion after they've tested it. And so um, they redesign it to kind of optimize their design and improve upon it. So not only do you, um, can you do some physical science in GSS standards with it, but it also um, gets at some uh, engineering in GSS standards as well. Um, and then at the end of each lesson, um, uh, we have a teacher guide. Um, so you can read through the teacher guide to help you set it up. And here we actually have some example data that we collected um, and some different crash barriers that we designed um, for the experiment. So this is just kind of an example of the free curriculum that you can find on our website. Um, so I encourage you to, to check that out um, so if, if you're kind of thinking about um, trying to find different ways that you can use Pocket Lab. So that's just one way that you can use uh, the accelerometer in Pocket Lab. Um, and now I'll talk briefly about collecting data with Pocket Lab. So um, to collect data, uh, and I'll have a video of this as well, um, you'll first want to select the type of data that you want to collect. So we were just collecting acceleration data. Um, so you'll, you'll select the data you want to collect. Then at the bottom of the graph is a record button. You hit record to start recording the data. Stop um, to stop recording the data. And then you'll be in what's called review mode, which I'll show you in the video. And from there, at the very bottom of the graph, again, is a button that says Save to Drive. And you can save um, to Google Drive right from there. So for the next video, um, I'll show you um, some other features in the Pocket Lab app, as well as the Google Drive integration. So uh, to change graphs, you want to click the graph icon in the upper right corner of the screen. And this will bring up the different graphs that use all the sensors in the Pocket Lab. You can change to the different graphs in this menu. Here, I'll select angular velocity, which measures rotation. And that's what we were measuring with the gymnast in the earlier video. If you want to display up to two graphs at once, you simply cl uh, click two graphs at the top of the menu screen and then uh, the two graphs you want to display. So here I've selected acceleration and, and angular velocity. And these are two good graphs um, that you want to use for different kinds of force and motion experiments. Uh, to go back to one graph, simply go back to the select graph menu and click one graph at the top of the menu screen. You can change how many measurements the pocket lab sensors take every second by clicking the speedometer icon in the upper right portion of the screen. So there are three uh, different speeds. I just click to the fastest speed, which is 20 samples per second. And then I click to the slowest speed, which is one sample per second. I then clicked it again to go back to the default uh, speed, which is 10 measurements every second. If you want to change the units of the data displayed, click the ruler icon in the upper corner of the screen. And you will see different options um, 
for displaying different units in, on the graph. Um, the Pocket Lab is always streaming data, um, but uh, the data isn't always recording. So it's useful for students to sort of play around with the Pocket Lab without the data recording, just so they can get a feel for how the sensors are working um, and how they're uh, measuring. But once, uh, let me pause it for a second. Um, but once uh, the students are ready to record, they go ahead and click uh, the recording button in the bottom of the screen like I did. Now the data is recording, and here I'm um, uh, shaking the pocket lab along the y-axis, and that's um, uh, showing acceleration along the blue y-graph there. So um, I'm now recording data, and then when I'm done with my experiment, I simply hit stop, and this will put the pocket lab into what's called review mode, where you can examine and save the recorded data. So as I hover the mouse over the different data points, the value of those data points is displayed below. If I click and drag, I can highlight different parts of the graph to zoom in on the data. To zoom back out, you simply just double click anywhere on the graph and you'll look at the entire uh, graph again. Again, this is really useful. So click and drag to zoom in on specific parts of the graph and then you can hover your mouse over the data points to display them, and then double click to zoom back out. To save the data, click Save to Drive. This will seamlessly transfer the data to a spreadsheet in your Google Drive account. I got ahead of myself, actually. So first, you can, um, you can actually replay the data stream by hitting Play, um, and you can just watch it over again. So that, that's what I just showed there. Um, so what you can what you can do then to save to drive to save your data is click save to drive, and it will um, it will automatically uh, send the the data to your Google Drive account. So the data file should be the most recent upload. So here I click on it, open it in my Google Drive, and you can now see the raw data collected in my experimental trial. On the left we have the time data. And then in the next column, we have the x-axis acceleration data, the y-axis acceleration data, and then finally the z-axis acceleration data. And students can do a lot with this raw data. However, you may notice that there's no graph of the data um, automatically generated. So you have to do that manually. That's um, pretty simple. So if you want to create a graph that looks like the graph in the Pocket Lab app, simply highlight all of the data. So yeah, simply highlight all of the data, and then click Insert Chart. You will then get an option for different ways to display the highlighted data. Click Chart Types and Line Graph. And then if you may notice um, that the time data is being displayed in the graph. That's that blue line, and we don't want that. We want the time data as the x-axis. So click Use Column A as Labels. And once you do that, you get a graph that looks a lot like um, the Pocket Lab, uh, the graph that we saw in the Pocket Lab app. And I can actually change the colors of the lines to match what I saw in the Pocket Lab app. So to do that, you go over to the right of the of the chart and there's a little icon that says edit so you click on the edit chart um, button and then you simply click on each line and you can change the color of it so I'll change the Y um, acceleration line to blue the X acceleration line to red and the Z acceleration line to green to match the colors in the Pocket Lab app and you don't have to do that but that can just be something um, you have your students do to try and uh, not only get themselves familiar with Google Drive, but also um, to do some a more in-depth uh, data analysis. Now, if I want to review the data points, like I can in the Pocket Lab app, I simply click the View Mode icon to the right of the chart, and after clicking that, when I hover my cursor over different data 
points on the graph, I get the value of the data points displayed, just like in the Pocket Lab app. So that shows you how to record an experimental trial and save and analyze the data, and then put that into Google Docs um, and, and integrate the data that way. Um, and you can now see how the graph in Google Docs is now the same as the graph in your Pocket Lab app. And so you can save that, have students turn, turn that in, um, whatever you want to do with the data from there. Okay. Um, so next, um, I'm going to talk about um, an experiment. Uh, I'm going to sort of walk you through an entire experiment um, that you can do with Pocket Lab, a very simple one. Um, that hits um, some NGSS standards and that can be found on our Pocket Lab uh, website. And so this is uh, called pressure and volume with a syringe. Um, and I'll show you a couple different ways to set it up. You don't actually, uh, you can do it a few different ways. So I'll, I'll show you it with the syringe um, and with also a, a, an Erlenmeyer flask. Um, so in this, uh, in this experiment, um, if you look at the objectives at the bottom, it says, in this experiment, students will determine the relationship between air pressure and volume using a syringe, and two, explore what is happening to the air molecules when there is greater or less air pressure. There's also an extension that they can do where they um, think about how temperature is related to pressure, and again, these are all important um, parts of some NGSS uh, physical science standards. So. I'll go ahead and walk you through this video. In this video, you will see elements of three different NGSS aligned activities that can be downloaded for free from the Pocket Lab community site. The first, the main, the main activity that this follows is the pressure and volume with the syringe, which explores Boyle's law and the ideal gas law. It will also be showing elements of measuring weight using Pocket Lab, which is a problem-solving activity involving air pressure that push, pushes students to think creatively, and a similar activity um, using ratios and proportions with Pocket Lab, which is sort of a math skills activity that you can do. This will most closely follow the pressure and volume with syringe. Um, in this activity, we'll use our Pocket Lab and a syringe um, and a flask with tubing. If the syringe is large enough for the pocket lab to fit inside, you can simply do this activity without the flask and tubing, just the syringe. Put the pocket lab inside the syringe, and then you can seal the end of the syringe with your finger. And now you can change the uh, volume of air inside the syringe just with the plunger. So you can do that in sort of a, a really quick way. But if, you're, if your syringe doesn't fit the pocket lab, then you can use the flask and tubing. So if using the flask and tubing, you will need a tightly fitting rubber stopper with a hole to fit the tube. Um, and the other end of the tube will fit over the syringe. In this setup, the pocket lab is sealed inside the flask and the flask is connected to the syringe with the tube. Um, and then uh, we also have, uh, we'll also use a plastic bag for this experiment. So um, in this, uh, so to start, start the lab, open up the pocket lab app, and connect the pocket lab, and then you'll select uh, the pressure graph. Start with just sort of an exploration with the students to kind of get them thinking about air pressure, and for that you'll just need a, a Ziploc bag. So change the graph um, to the pressure graph. And then you're going to have students, um, once they're measuring pressure, place the pocket lab inside the Ziploc bag. When the pocket lab is inside the Ziploc bag, um, which we'll do here in a second, um, have them seal it up most of the way and then maybe blow air into it. Um, but we want to make sure that you get some air trapped inside the bag with the pocket lab. Now, what you want to do is encourage students to explore the pressure graph as they manipulate the plastic bag. So as they squeeze the bag, they will feel the pressure in the bag increase 
as the air pushes back harder on the surface of the bag. They will then see a corresponding change in the graph. This is a great way to get students thinking and talking about the definition of air pressure and how it may change as the volume in the bag changes. So it's a really cool kind of easy activity. We will now record changes in air pressure when volume changes in a much more controlled setup. And this is where they'll really collect the data. So um, if using just the syringe, just like I showed earlier, you place the pocket lab in the syringe um, and then use the plunger to change the volume of air while recording the air pressure. So you can see how I sort of do that here. Um, but we'll show the procedure in more detail with the setup um, with the flask. I just want to show you how to do that if you were just using a syringe. If using the flask, seal the pocket lab in the flask with the syringe connected. The flask and tube is approximately 500 milliliters, and we will start the syringe at the 140 milliliter mark. So therefore, we have a total of about 600 milliliters in the entire setup. So we're starting at 640 milliliters and we're going to decrease the air pressure. So start by recording and we're going to record for a few seconds at 640 milliliters. Then decrease the volume by 20 milliliters to 620 milliliters. And then do that again to 600 milliliters and observe how the graph is changing. Finally do it to 500 milliliters. And you'll notice at some point the rubber stop will pop off from the air pressure. So have students you know, note that and uh, that observation and they can discuss it in their conclusion. So you stop recording the data and now in the review mode I can clearly see how the pressure changed at different volumes. I can replay the experimental trial by hitting the play button at the bottom of the graph and at any point during the playback I can hit the stop button to examine that portion of the trial. So that's just from 600, 640 milliliters to 620 milliliters is that little portion of the graph and I can kind of examine that more closely. Um, and here I can see that it changed from about 1,000 millibars, 1,007 millibars of pressure to 1,040 millibars of pressure when the volume decreased by 20 milliliters. So those are some things that students can be recording in their notebook um, as they're writing this down. So um, once, uh, once you need to, you can um, uh, go ahead and uh, save to Google Drive. And we can uh, look at the data in a little more detail. So you click Save to Drive. And now I have uh, two columns, time and pressure. So I first want to replicate the pressure versus time graph um, that we had in the Pocket Lab app. So again, this is pretty simple. You just highlight all of the data, and then you click uh, Insert Chart. And actually, this first chart for me looks good because it doesn't use um, a time. It, it shows time along the x-axis. So you can see that at the bottom. The time is displayed on the, as the x-axis, not in the graph itself, and pressure is in the graph. But if for some reason you don't have that, um, make sure you have the use column A as labels, and that will make sure that only pressure is displayed as a graph. So I can just insert that graph. And again, if you want to view the different data points, you click the view mode, and then you hover your cursor over the data and uh, over the different points, and the data is displayed just like in the Pocket Lab app. Um, I went ahead and added um, some text boxes that shows the different um, volumes at the different points in the graph. And you could have your students do that if they were putting this in like a lab report. 
Um, but right now the data table is looking at pressure versus time and we've then labeled um, the change in the volume but it's not the greatest way to look at pressure versus volume um, to do that we would actually want a pressure versus volume graph so what you can do is create a new data table with just a little bit of data analysis and you do that by um, making a table um, on one column write volume and on the other you write average pressure put in the changes in volume and then what I can do is find the average volume for 640 milliliters. So I go up to my graph and I see that between 0 and 5.92 seconds, the volume in the syringe was 640 milliliters. So now I can insert a function to find the average volume between those times. So I go up and start at 0 seconds, and I highlight all the data points between 0 seconds and 5.92 seconds. And then Google Docs will automatically find the average for me. I do the same thing for 620 milliliters. Um, between 7.81 seconds and 10.82 seconds, the volume was at 620 milliliters. So I insert an average function and I highlight the data between 7.81 and 10.82 seconds. Or, um, and then I get the average for that and I can do the same follow the same steps for 600 and 580 milliliters. So this is some much more advanced features um, of Google Drive but it's uh, it can be helpful if, if you've been using this a little while in your classroom and you want to do some more um, some more advanced data analysis. So now to get a new graph of volume versus of pressure versus volume I highlight that data I click insert chart and I'm um, noticing here that they put a volume in the graph. I don't want that. I want um, volume on the x-axis. So I go here, I click use, column D as labels. And then this is showing a bar graph, which is helpful. I can click it to a line graph if I want. Um, but I think for this case, I think a scatter plot would be best. I put in the scatter plot. And then to the right of the chart, I can click the edit mode, and this is pretty cool. Um, I can click on the data points, and I can actually insert a line of best fit. So again, you may not be at this point with your students at the beginning of the year, but this is certainly some advanced features that you can do with all of the data that you collected with Pocket Lab um, and with uh, the power of Google Docs and, and how easily they can integrate between each other. So now I've got two really cool charts that show how pressure and air pressure and volume are related. And they both show that as I decrease the pressure, um, the, or excuse me, as I decrease the volume, the air pressure uh, increases. And it's a um, fundamental uh, physical law for a lot of different things, including some NGSS standards that you'll want to teach. Okay. So now I've talked about. Um, I've shown you an investi a sort of a, a, a standard pocket lab investigation from start to finish. Um, I've showed you kind of a brief overview of how to use the accelerometer and how to integrate uh, your data with Google Drive. Um, so now I'll go ahead, um, I'll show you just uh, a couple resources and then I'll take some questions. So um, uh, here's an alignment guide to our different NGSS standards and that can be found um, on our community webpage. Um, if you go to the educators tab, you will find uh, an alignment guide um, and a list of all the different activities that we have. Um, on that community page, uh, you will find over, um, when you click on the educators uh, tab, you'll find over 30 free classroom activities and experiments for Pocket Lab. Um, you'll find videos of those activities. Um, you'll also, this is really exciting, we, um, we just started our user created lesson plans page where users have been submitting um, ways that they've used Pocket Lab in their classroom, and we have dozens of them already. Um, we had a really great physics teacher who uh, uh, did over um, 18 lessons for us, um, just uh, some things that he's been doing in his classroom, and they're really, really great. They all have videos there. So if you're if you're trying to figure out what can I do with Pocket Lab, head to our community page, go to our homepage, head to our community page, 
and you'll find tons and tons of resources there. Um, so now I'll go ahead and um, answer um, some questions that may have come up. Hi, uh, this is Stephanie with CTL, and thanks uh, for this, Robbie. I really have been enjoying this presentation, especially how easy it is to integrate the Pocket Lab with your Google Drive and get all the data yes. right in there. Um, so I think that's something that the teachers probably really appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, we, there's a couple questions. One um, is related to using the Pocket Lab in a classroom full of Chromebooks. Um, yes. Yes, how can you know which Chromebook the Pocket Lab will connect to? Yes, it's a really good question. So um, we there's a couple things um, that you can do. So if you've noticed, if you tried to use uh, Pocket Lab with a lot of, uh, or a lot of Pocket Labs at once with a lot of Chromebooks, like in a, in a classroom setting, um, you may notice that um, the Pocket Lab will, or the, the Chromebook app will sort of uh, see all of the different Pocket Labs in the classroom. So how do you figure out which um, Pocket Lab to connect to, I guess? Um, and so in the app, um, there's been an update to the app over the summer. So if you were maybe using um, the, the app before the summer, um, uh, you can go back and maybe update it. Um, but in the update, um, the app will actually filter out um, pocket labs that are far away. And you'll sort of see a, um, what it'll do is it'll show um, the first pocket lab in the list of pocket labs to connect is always the closest pocket lab to the Chromebook. So basically what you want to do is have students turn the pocket lab on and put the pocket lab right up against the Chromebook that they want to connect to. And then that'll be the pocket lab that connects automatically. So the app itself will like rank the pocket labs based on how far away they are from the Chromebook. So we've we've done that. Um, we've set that up with with you guys in mind, with teachers in mind, trying to connect a lot of pocket labs at once. So the app will order them um, based on proximity. Well, that's smart. That kind of makes sense since it's a scientific sensor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's very yeah. cool. We have uh, some smart engineers over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of positive feedback, even in um, not in the form of questions, but just um, a teacher saying, "I wish I had these last year to teach <laughs> math laws to students in my chemistry yeah. class." Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So, but now, yeah, it should be set up for this year. And then, um, since you are using the Pocket Lab and you know some different experiments, what about mm -hmm. putting it in water? Is that possible? Um, yes, good question. Um, unfortunately, Pocket Lab um, is not waterproof, um, and and so you can't submerge it in water. Um, and and one of the sort of one of the main questions we get about this is whether Pocket Lab, uh, because it is a temperature sensor, um, oftentimes people want to stick it in a solution, um, like in a chemistry experiment. Uh, but that's not really what the temperature sensor is built for. Um, the temperature sensor is more for ambient temperature, so if you're doing like weather experiments or you're getting room temperature, um, but it doesn't, um, it's not good for measuring the temperature of a liquid. And um, one reason is it's not like a temperature probe, like a, you know, like with a metal tip that you would stick in something. Um, and it's also not waterproof, so if you were to stick it in, water would, you know, liquid would get in there. Um, but there are some experiments where you can. Um, submerge it, um, but if you do that, and we have some of those on our website, if you do that though, um, you want to seal the pocket lab in something that's waterproof. Um, so like in a couple plastic bags and really duct tape those plastic bags up and really make sure that no water's getting in it. And then um, I would really only put it at the very surface of the water. Um, and another, another sort of issue with that, just in general, is that um, Radio waves um, don't don't travel through water very well. Um, so, like a Bluetooth connection, even if you were to submerge it, um, it would it would probably disconnect. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, don't don't just stick it totally in water. Um, if you are going to do something where it could get wet, um, I'd recommend um, sealing it up in, in a plastic bag or something. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, I think. Um... It's it's always good to know the parameters of yeah, what yeah. <laughs> you can do there, with it. 
Yeah. Um, and on the on the on and off button, there's a you'll see a little hole like a the on and off button. Like you can actually almost see inside the pocket lap um, where the on switch is, and so water would get into that area and get into the circuit board. Um, and but the reason there is that hole is because it it helps the air pressure sensor work better. Um, so you get more accurate um, air pressure sensor readings if if air can easily get into the to where the sensor is. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I'm just looking to see if anything else comes in. This is sort of the last chance if anyone, not really the last chance because they can email you, right, if yes, something yes. else comes up. But for this, the purpose of this webinar, uh, you've given such a thorough presentation and then also you will, you mentioned some of the videos. This whole mm -hmm. presentation has been recorded, but um, there's also the other resources that, that you're showing here that people can watch more videos and experiments, correct? Yes, yes. and um, the videos that I showed, um, I sort of did a live voiceover for the webinar as I went through those videos, but um, if you want to just watch the videos, there's um, I, I did previously record those videos with me talking through it, um, and so if you want to just watch the videos, I'll make those available as well. Um, the, the ones that I showed in the in the presentation, and then you can go to our. I, I just really encourage you to go to our community site uh, because there are there's a videos page that has just tons of videos, even from that we've created, but also just from all of our users that you know that submit videos on social media of them trying some like crazy experiments with Pocket Lab um, mm -hmm. videos of people using it in their classroom. So um, it's a really, really great resource if you're thinking, okay, this is cool, but how do I use it in my classroom? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can find our curriculum, but if you want to just get some cool ideas, like search through the videos page, and there's a lot of great, great stuff there. And if you do something cool in your classroom and you want to, you know, if you take a video and tweet it to us or send it to us on social media, we'll retweet it, we'll post it on our site. Um, so if you want to, um, if you want to do that, I encourage you to do that as well. And and also, um, if you do create a lesson plan that you think would be really helpful for other um, teachers, especially in Nevada, that are you guys are all have the same standards to teach, um, post it to our user created lesson plans page. There's some instructions about how to post it, or you could just email it to me and I'll post it. But if you want to share those lesson plans, I think that'd be a really cool thing. If you, if um, if you guys are all uh, if, if, if all the teachers are sharing their things that they're doing in their classroom. Yeah, I agree. And we have our own Google Plus community oh, yeah. for the teachers, Perfect. too. So I would encourage them to share there as well. Um, yes. And, yeah, yeah. you know, both places, really, because you, I think networking and sharing is the best way to, to probably build up a library of these lesson plans. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, well, great. I think we're ready to wrap up. I see Amy's put up our, our closing slide here. Okay. okay. Well, great questions. And, Robbie, this was fantastic. Thank you. And thank you, uh, participants, for your questions as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So if any of you guys have any questions, always, you know, it's up on the screen. Email, contact us. Um, and you will also receive a certificate of completion now, but... The, the catch is, is you got to click on the link and fill out the survey because we really do want to hear your feedback and how effective these webinars are and to see how we can improve these um, as well. So please take time to give us that feedback. Um, and of course, don't forget to visit uh, the nr21.ctel.net website. Um, that's going to have a link, links to all of the information in the upcoming webinars. Um, and something else, too, is if you scroll down, you'll see a little um, kind of submission button with your email. And if you put that in there as subscription, it'll populate right into um, your Google Calendar. Um, yeah. So this recording um, will stop as soon as we're done, and it will be emailed to you guys within about 24 to 48 hours. And you can find part one of the Pocket Lab webinar as well. And I will close it out today. So on behalf of CTL and Dr. Robbie, thanks for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.